Good morning, everyone, and thanks for sticking with us for our panel on patient engagement. My name is Alex Fix, and as uh, Dr. White said, I'm a primary care pediatrician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a faculty member in our Center of Biomedical Informatics. And a lot of my work concerns how we can use health information technology to improve patient engagement. So I'm very pleased to welcome our panel. I'll each introduce each speaker before they come up so you know exactly all the details right before they speak. But I wanted to take a couple of minutes just to speak about patient engagement a little bit more broadly before we jump into sort of individual component issues that, that, that comprise the, the broader idea. So I'm the co-inventor of um, some software called the Care Assistant, which appears in these slides. I have no patent and it doesn't only come from the invention. Um, so patient activation is one term that we hear a lot. So that, that's been defined as a patient's knowledge, skills, ability, and willingness to manage his or her health and care. Patient engagement is a little broader than that. It combines patient activation <laughs> with interventions designed to increase activation and promote healthy behavior, such as obtaining preventive care or exercise. So why focus on patient engagement, and why have a session on it in the context of an informatics symposium? So the literature increasingly suggests, in a variety of different ways, that people actively involved in their health and health care tend to have better outcomes and possibly even lower health care costs. So there's benefits both to the individual and to society. This slide is from a health affairs publication that came out recently, and it talks about patient engagement on different levels. I think that's important to think about just to get a full sense of the breadth of the idea. So a direct patient, so um, simply there's sort of three areas or levels of engagement. Engagement in direct patient care, engagement in the organizational design and governance of healthcare, and engagement in policy making. And then that engagement, the intensity of that engagement increases from consultation to involvement to partnership and leadership. So for example, in the setting of direct patient care, patients might receive information about a diagnosis, something that's fairly common. They might get more involved. They might be asked about their preferences or their goals and how they would like to see their treatment unfold. And finally, it might reach a state of what some people have called shared leadership or shared decision making, where treatment decisions are truly based on the patient's preferences that are sort of reached and um, influenced through consultation with the clinical provider. On an organizational level, things may begin with organizational surveys about patients. What do you think about your visit yesterday? The hospital may then involve, involve patients as advisors, which many do. And then patients may actually assume leadership positions, <coughs> co-leading hospital safety or quality improvement committees to direct care in a way that's more patient-friendly. On the public policy level, you know, a public policy agency might conduct focus groups with patients or the public to find out more. They might incorporate their recommendations into decisions. And finally, they might give patients or families an equal stake in decision making. Engagement depends on both the patient, on the healthcare organization, and on society. So at all of those levels, patient engagement is in. And there's one piece that in our discussions prior to the session we also realized, which is that it's not just about direct care or organization and government, governance or policy making, but there really is an even broader idea that patient engagement informs, which is this notion of a learning healthcare system. So this is the idea that um, when I'm seeing patients on Mondays as I do, um, and I'm seeing patients one at a time, my experience comes from what patients tell me, but there's a whole host of experiences that I have, that my patients have, that the office staff has, that never are really synthesized or incorporated, or at least rarely, where the actual care delivered through a scientific process could then inform new evidence that could inform improved care in a continuous cycle of improvement. And I think when people think of the ultimate vision of what engagement might entail, it's that it's taking the patient's input, the clinical team's input at every point in the process and really using that to make healthcare as effective and patient-centered as it possibly can be. So one of the ways that the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia that we've sort of taken on this task is there's this notion in clinical decision support that it's really about reminding the doctor to do the right thing. And we really have conceptualized it very differently in the sense that we think of patient engagement and clinical decision support as a tool to really 
engage the practitioner and the families in partnership. And so as one sort of concrete manifestation of that, over the last year we've designed something that we call the Shared Decision Making Portal. So with a common interface that patients can see through, um, through a web-based patient portal or that doctors can see through some of the software we've developed in the office, patients' concerns, their goals, their progress toward reaching them, their current symptomatology, how they're doing with taking their medication, are all monitored over time as a way of making office contacts more efficient and more patient-centered. So this is the patient, what the patient sees when, when they're on the uh, portal. And you can see that the view for the clinician is very similar. And one thing that we found actually through our research is that much more than we even may have expected, that really families and doctors really want to share a common set of information. Whereas doctors may have a bit more professional knowledge and patients may be perhaps a bit more real-world experience, when it comes to working together, the, the key components of that partnership are really very similar. So without further ado, I wanted to sit down and introduce our next um, panelist and um, move on with our discussion from there. So, we need to so as we're switching over to the left, uh, I wanted to first introduce um, Regina Holiday was nice enough to join us today. So she is an activist, artist, and speaker, an author who lives in Washington, D.C. At healthcare conferences, she's often seen painting the content she hears from patients' and families' perspective. And she actually has been in the back of the room already this morning working on her, um, on her painting. And it's something that you can see and stop by as you're sort of moving in and out of the room and around the conference today. So she's also a mother and a widow, and she speaks about the benefits of health IT and timely access for patients due to her own personal family loss. In 2009, she painted a series of murals depicting the need for clarity and transparency in medical records. This advocacy mission was inspired by her late husband, Frederick Allen Halliday II, and his struggle to get appropriate care during 11 weeks of continuous hospitalization at five healthcare facilities. And of importance, her paintings really became part of the national debate on healthcare reform and helped to guide public policy. So without further ado, let me introduce Regina Holliday, who can really share with us, like few other people, the patient's perspective when it comes to health information. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> excited to be here, and that amazing bio left something out that I thought was incredibly important, and then I'm presenting here, which I worked 16 years in a retail setting in a toy store, okay? So your clients, they came to where I worked all the time and loved it. So, and one of the things that um, was a frequent question when I first began working in the 1990s was, where did we stock the toy boxes? And we're like, uh, uh, there, aren't there aren't toy boxes, boxes anymore. See, kids have, See, kids have too many toys these days. It's called toy systems. systems. So think, <laughs> I think I key <laughs> out lots of bits, okay? okay? And just, and just like, like toys, toys no longer will fit, fit in a box, your medical, your medical records, records will no longer fit in a file. file. We have grown, we have grown beyond, beyond that. that. Just if we indicate, utilize clinical results, traditional stuff with chronic blood clinical records, not even involving genomics and social history, there's still too much. Unless you involve an electronic medical record system that allows us to access that data. So, so one time during Christmas, this past year, I still help out occasionally at the toy store, even though I do this number one all the time. I asked my fellow co-workers, who said, OK, which would Desert Island you could only bring four toys? What toys would you bring? Now, look at all these very different answers. And these are toy professionals, OK? They are making some great choices for you. But remember, they are professionals making the choice they would recommend. If I asked the average five-year-old if this would be their choice, they would probably say no. You see, everyone, you see, everyone is individual. Their desires, their desires and what they want to play with are unique, unique to them individual. as an individual. Our choices, our choices and, and our suggestions are, you know, are great guidance, but we need to keep that in mind. Recently, I got to see Leslie Kelly Hall present an amazing 
teaching speech about, her, about her mother's, mother's care. care. She's, she's Leslie's, Leslie's very, very, very involved, involved within the healthcare space and what's going on with electrical medical records. And her mother, and her mother had, her mother had, had lots of conversations, conversations but didn't have a conversation about this. See, when her mother, See, when her mother went to the um, care provider who took Medicare patients, she spoke to, she spoke to the, the receptionist, the receptionist made it very clear that on this appointment you can only talk about four things. So pick your so four. Well, Lizzie's mother did that. It decided the, it decided the pain, pain in her shoulder wasn't a significant problem, so she wouldn't, so she wouldn't mention that at multiple appointments. Until the pain until went too bad, too bad it turned out she had, metastasis she had metastasis in her shoulder. That was the pain. That was the pain. And she died soon she after. after. But she had to pick just four. Think about that. A system that doesn't allow us to talk about the things we need to talk about and what we're truly focused on. You see, for years I worked in a toy store, and one day we had a customer who came in, and she came in to buy that toy, an Ogo Sport Ring. It's an amazing toy. Tech can tell you how amazing that toy is, because we actually played with it on a stage at a medical conference. It was great. We both failed at that, but we learned something about embracing failure. Well, she asked about that toy, and she asked about it because she had an entire list of toys. And i got to tell you, I looked at this list. It was a $1,000 sale. Yes, right? But when I looked at the list, I realized very quickly, every single thing on her list was speech, language, occupational therapy, behavioral awareness type toys. This was a very, very special list. And I asked her, where did you get this list? She said, well, I just got my son tested to go into a private school. You know, he's in preschool now. And they say he failed, that he has scattered. And um, he has to play with all these toys for a year. And he has to learn how to do better. And then he'll test well. I said, really? Do you know what scatter means? She said, no, I want to ask you a series of questions. When your child was little, did he spin wheels? Like the stroller wheels or the car wheels, did he have fun with that? And she said, yes. Did he talk early or talk a little bit late? Well, he was a little later. When he was a little younger than he is now, did he want to play with dinosaurs and talk about dinosaurs or trains or bugs or anything all the time? You know, he didn't want to change topic. She said, oh, yeah, he's into Thomas the Tank Engine. He just loves that show, and he knows all the trains, and he's got a chart, and he pays attention to what's happening with every character, and he just wants to talk about that. And so I paused. I said, ma'am, do you think maybe your son has autism? And I watched her face break before me. And she said, yes, oh, yes, I do. But nobody talks to me about that. The school doesn't talk to me about that. The doctor doesn't talk to me about that. So that day in a toy store, I hugged a customer. I gave her the conversation she needed to have. And did I sell a bunch of toys? No. But I started her on a care journey that would affect the rest of her life. You see, we have a whole bunch of patients right now that are suffering. See, in the back of their mind, they're playing this game called Monopoly. Remember Monopoly? I loved that game as a kid. What I did not love was my brother beating me every single time. You see those red hotels? They destroyed me every time. And in healthcare right now, it's not the red hotel, it's the giant white hospital. See, we're scared and we're worried and we don't know how much things cost and we don't know what we're supposed to do and we don't know if we can ask that fifth question. There's this amazing thing called the Adverse Childhood Experience Survey, or ACEs. There's a doctor in San Francisco named Nadine Burke, and she uses it with all her pediatric patients in a low-income setting. And she uses it because Kaiser Permanente and the CDC did this study and determined that individuals had certain things that happened in their childhood would dramatically impact the rest of their life. So if you had abuse in the home, drug use, a parent who was imprisoned, a parent who died, somebody who was mentally ill within the home, your chances of having a heart attack later in life were greatly, greatly higher than that of the rest of society. But yet these questions are not asked. You see, when I was a child, I was abused. I did deal with an abusive household. And the toy box you saw on that first slide, that would be the toy box that was at a flea market because we resold our toys every single week. And when I was only 12 years of age, I was able to buy a gun at a flea market for my father, who was a felon. And then he threatened me with that gun for the next coming years until finally, even as a child, I grabbed the bravery to call out for help. The bravery that so many patients do not have because they're scared. See, we play a game. We play a game with lives, with children and with their parents. I had a husband. I have two wonderful children. 
We went into the roller coaster that is healthcare today. We went into a system where my husband was seen at five facilities without access to electronic medical record, without access to the data. Oops, sorry about that. When we are treated that way, we become scared and we stop trusting people. We start asking so many questions, and we'll ask questions to everybody, and that's what I did. I asked every single question. When my husband was sick and first diagnosed, he was at a facility in which they had an electronic medical record system when we couldn't see it. An oncologist who went to a medical conference for four days and left us in a room without access to information and no understanding of the care situation. I asked everyone I saw what was going on. When the oncologist came back to speak to my husband after his trip, he said to him, so I understand your wife's been asking questions about this case. And my husband said, yes. He said, well, if little Miss A-type personality has questions, she needs to come to my office hours. And this is a painting of that day. And everything is true to the moment, except for in the reality, I had a chair, but emotionally I was kneeling. He never turned the computer screen around to where I could see what was going on. He didn't stop answering the phone. He didn't stop talking to the nurses about the parking lot problems or the fact that Ms. Rosen had a chemotherapy suite and whether it would be available later that day. And all the while I'm asking questions, he, he's speaking so rapidly and using these scientific words I just don't understand. So I say, please, could you slow down because I've got I've to research these words online. And he said, I don't like people who research online. I said, I'm sorry that I don't have a background in medicine. My only way to understand you is to, is to look at these words. And he said, that's right, I'm the one with the medical degree. So if you look at the wall in the background, that's not a diploma on the wall, that's a piece of paper that says I have a medical degree. And if you look at the other side, that's a portrait of his family. But if you look in the shadows behind it, that's a portrait of ours. Because this is a moment when a family's being broken apart. All the time my husband was in a hospital, I would go home every night after caregiving, and I would talk to the wonderful concierge in my apartment building. Her name is Valerie Barnes, and she's an amazing woman. And for 23 years, she took care of a son with severe developmental delays. He's had multiple brain surgeries. He goes into a care setting, and I told him of our experiences and told, him, told her, do not go into that hospital without supervision. Very soon after, her son was found unresponsive in his care setting and an adult daycare, was sent to the same facility my husband was at. She called her husband in a panic, and he got there as fast as he could. You see, they'd seen the transition between pediatric care and adult care, and they were not happy with what they had seen. When he arrived at the facility, the son was still in the hallway. The EMTs had not completely released the case because nobody was taking over. The father said, have you looked in his throat? Is there an obstruction? They said, we haven't seen anything. The father went over, pulled his son's jaws open, and pulled a therapy glove out of the child's throat and probably saved his life. Because I had had a conversation with a concierge in an apartment building. See, patients talking to each other and spreading news, that changes lives. What if we could have a report card about hospitals? I never have been treated at George Washington University Medical Center, but I painted this painting about them based on open data sets from hospitalcompare.gov. And if you look at that stormy sky, that's their clinicals, and their clinicals rock. It's like the 90th and 100 percentiles. But if you look at that poor girl with that report card, those are their patient satisfaction scores. And when it comes to patient satisfactions, that facility is getting C's, D's, and F's based on 2010 data. And when I painted this, I painted it in front of the institution on the sidewalk, and everybody walking out talked to me. See, that's the beauty of open data. We begin to communicate. Okay, that's a 20 cue ball. Who's played with the 20 cue ball? It's a toy. It's an amazing toy. You must have played. Oh, see a few hands. Okay, so 20 cue ball is spectacular. It's a toy that's loaded with a mathematical logarithm, auto taxonomy, and a dictionary. So you think of anything in the whole world, and that ball, my goodness, will figure it out, usually within 20 questions. And I gotta tell you, the only reason it doesn't sometimes figure it out is they tweak the code. See, they found human beings don't like to fail, so they like to occasionally win. So the ball itself is designed to let you win. That's technology, okay? So can you imagine a 20 cue ball in medicine that asks things like, do you have night sweats? Do you have blood in your urine? Do you have bone pain? Have you had weight loss? Can you imagine a device like this in triage that asks, do you have kidney cancer? The kind of disease that destroyed my husband. See, technology, it catches zebras. It sees more than the person that's right in front of it. 
My son went to a clinic appointment in Washington, D.C., and it was amazing. Okay, this is a clinic, a walk-in clinic. And they handed him that netbook, and they said, okay, he was five. You can start building your electronic medical record. And you know what he started to do? He started to type everything he could. It was wonderful. It was brilliant. And you know, he's only five, so I started to help him through the process. We asked all kinds of questions to each other, and then we pushed submit, and it went. And then we tried to turn the netbook back into the office, and she said, no, 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 you pushed submit. It went to us online. So now you can surf the web for the rest of your appointment. So my son was surfing the web, and then finally the doctor saw him and told him about his eye condition and what it meant. And then he Googled his eye condition there in the appointment, showed my son an article from Wikipedia on it. They rocked out and had a wonderful time. My son left that appointment so happy. And then one month later, we had a regular pediatric checkup. And at that appointment, the doctor, who was a lovely woman, turned her back, sat at her computer screen, and just randomly asked questions into the air. And my son got the wiggles. You know, he's sitting up there, he's starting to shake. He jumps off the table and walks up to the doctor and says, when's it my turn to type? <laughs> okay? See, that's what we're headed toward. Now, you might have noticed me in the back of the room, and you might have noticed the fact. I have a painting on my back, and there's a whole bunch of us with paintings on their back. It's called the walking gallery, and the idea being that patients must wear their stories, share their stories to get change. See, my son, who's my eldest, he has autism. And when he was involved in my husband's care, he was just like the eye in a door crack. So I painted him as an eye in a door crack within this really large painting I did. But he is now at a point where he helped me design his own jacket. He said, Mommy, I want you to paint that part in the parking lot of the hospital where they have that, that sh thing and they charge you money, and then I want you to put a skull on top of that and put coins in the mouth because you shouldn't make a parent, family pay to park when they're visiting their dying father. And my younger son, he painted his own jacket. It's called Feelings, and guess what it's about? It's about his clinic doctor's appointment where they checked his eye because he said, you know what? That made me feel good. It made me feel important. And so he marches wearing that. I recently started a petition on change.org to encourage Hallmark to create hospice cards. I know I'm a data access advocate, but I'm encouraging paper. I'm encouraging conversation. And why I do this is because of this wonderful woman who works at the toy store named Morgan. She was on a trip to Europe when her mother was diagnosed with cancer. And she was told, you know, there were things that could be done and treatments that could happen, and they decided to not tell Morgan not tell Morgan to come home as quickly as possible. Because, you know, we don't talk about death in this culture. And we don't always talk about realistically what will happen next. So Morgan did not get to say goodbye to her mother. And I painted that. So we must talk for more than data. We must talk about lives. Right now, if you go to Kaiser Health News and you look at their Facebook page, what will you see is this image, which is the walking gallery in its Lego form. See, I made Lego figures for every single one of us who walk around the world in jackets because you know we can't get together. We're all over the place. But we can get together in the world of toys. We can get together in something like this that unifies us all. My first jacket for the walking gallery was this image, a giant letter A. For I am Little Miss A type personality, right? And this style of painting is called painting in negative space. You see, I did not paint truly the letter A. I painted the world around it. You can take a negative and you can turn it into a positive. And if you combine what he's talking about with genomics, with what I'm talking about with social history and then patient access, well, you're just going to change the world.
Hey everyone. All right, so I'm going to talk. I'm, I'm going to talk about the patient, and Regina is actually one of our members at Kaiser Permanente, Permanente since since Fred died. Um, and this is where I work in Washington D.C. at the Center for Total Health. It's right by Union Station. It's very high tech. That's an augmented reality display where we we take a mock exam room and show people how we design it for maximum um, communication and support. If any of you are in Washington, please look me up. I'm happy to give you a VIP tour. It's a pretty amazing place. So um, I used to show slides of the size of Kaiser Permanente, number of people we have, and all that kind of stuff. So now I use this instead to show our size. It's, the, it's our carbon footprint. So we're the first US health system um, to have a verified carbon footprint. And what I'm trying to show is that we're, we're, into, we're in a space where we're moving beyond actual medical care into the way we support our environment. Um, so we have pledged by 2020 to reduce our carbon footprint by 30%. A big way we do that is through IT, and not just by going paperless, but by managing the amount of electricity we use in our data centers. So if you go paperless, but you don't manage your data centers, you will actually use more energy. So something to keep in mind. We're at, we're at about uh, a fifth of the um, NHS. And just to get a sense, our, re our revenue is about $50 billion a year, about our size. So this is my very first tweet in 2008. So that was five years ago. So the very first thing I said on Twitter was, a bit, was about patient family engagement. So I've been really interested in this for a long time. When I was at Group Health Cooperative, uh, our, our landmark idea was that patients had access to the medical record at the same time as the doctor. So we were the first Epic client to have both gone at the same time. So let me ask in the audience, who has ever emailed your doctor in your entire life? Raise your hand. Good. <laughs> um, who is a clinician? Raise your hand. And keep it up if you've ever emailed a patient. All right, not bad. Who has seen, your, who has seen their medical record online? Raise your hand. Not bad. That's like, 40%, 40%, okay, good. Okay, so um, this is the way we were all trained, doctors of the 19th century, and this is the patient of the 21st century. So at Kaiser Permanente, our patient portal is now accessible by any mobile device, um, including our website, of course. The interesting thing about this culture change-wise is that you know, 10 years ago when we started doing this, we had a long conversation about emailing patients online. When we converted to mobile last year, there was no discussion. So we just did it. So it went from you could, you could access your doctor only if you went to a computer with an internet connection to anywhere they are. Traveling, I can email my doctor from a baggage carousel, no big deal. And now 23% of all the accesses to our website are through a mobile device. And these are the numbers. So if you were a venture capitalist, you would call this a hockey stick. So in a world where people say, well, we're not really sure if patient health portals are valuable or people want to use them, and many famous players have gone out of business, what we're finding is we, we haven't had that problem at all. So we're now at 4.2 million people online with us. It's 65% of our eligible users. So imagine a health system where over half of the people that see you are accessing you online. And when I shadow other physicians delivering care, it's a very normal part of business. How would you like me to connect with you? Can you email me in a couple days? You will get that lab result today when it is run from the lab. It's a very different way of practicing than maybe we'll call you if it's abnormal in two weeks. Um, and these are just the numbers, just to get a sense. So we're, we're, actually, we're actually receiving a million, over a million emails a month from our patients. We're actually sending out 580,000, so it's a very two-way system. It's, we're not just waiting for people to, to write us. Um, eight, uh, about two million lab tests re reviewed on, online by patients. Most of them are delivered in real time. Um, and then it's very sticky, so 32% sign on five or more times. So people say, do people come back? They absolutely come back, and it's still growing for us. Um, we're, we hope to get up to 80%. So um, right now in America, about 83% of people are online. So 17% are not on the internet, believe it or not. Um, okay, so I already showed you this. And um, so the next thing for us uh, beyond that is thinking about social media. So we are now working with our physicians to be online for patients in very different ways. So the, the key thing about all of this is listening. Um, it, you, when you start emailing your patients, as many of you are doing now, you learn more about them that they don't tell you in the exam room. So as Regina mentioned, listening to your patient when they're at work, they're at home, they're traveling, they need help, we want to hear about that from them. So we're exploring different ways to connect with them uh, securely and privately through our website mobile, but also to, for them to know about us uh, via social media. And then being there means more than just um, the medical records. So also being with our patients and supporting them like at places like this. So Regina didn't show this, but it's a very famous mural in Washington, D.C. Has anyone been to the 73 cents mural? Not yet. Okay, where is it? Tell them where it is. 50110 Avenue. 
So it's an 18-foot high mural, and I call it a national monument to patients in, Wa in Washington, D.C. Um, it will definitely move you. If, if Regina's speech moved you like it did me, it'll definitely move you times 10. Um, I, public I took this photograph, put it on social media, and then the BMJ picked it up and published it in their in international print edition. So for me, it's actually changing not how we deliver care, but also how we interact with all of our, our members and patients, wherever they are. And as Regina said, we, she and I did a TED Talk uh, in 2012 at Henry Ford uh, Health System. And we used that, that bouncing ball tool. And what we wanted to demonstrate is that toy which Regina introduced to me, if you do it by yourself, it works just great. But when you try and do it with another person, that's when it becomes more complicated. And you know, we're in a healthcare system, generally speaking, where we're comfortable not involving patients. We feel like we're, we're, we're good enough on our own and we bounce the ball by ourselves, but we don't know what, what we're missing. And so what we're trying to show is that it's okay to fail a little bit with your patients because overall the product is better. So in my work, I try and involve patients whenever possible and now more and more, and this is the first time I'm actually involving a patient in an event from start to finish, um, coaching us all the way through so it's a better result. And then um, back to, I just wanna talk about the big picture. So what we know is that health doesn't happen in an exam room. And so if you only see your patients in exam rooms, you're really not understanding who they are and where they come from. So at Kaiser Permanente, you see there's a telehealth cart. Um, you see there's a, that's actually a templated exam room in the Center for Total Health, which you can come see. It allows the uh, care provider to look at the patient, and then the patient can see everything on the monitor on the wall. So they're totally involved in the care. And then, again, they're also involved when they're not in the exam room with us. So for us, you know, health happens outside of the exam room. So we have a very big uh, um, uh, initiative on walking called Everybody Walk, and I do all my meetings on foot. Um, who does walking meetings here or has ever done one? Okay, that's your next innovation. So when you do a, when you do a meeting, do it on foot. Um, and then for us, mm -hmm. health happens outside of the exam room as well. So if you can see there on the top of that building, that's one of our medical offices in California that has solar panels on top. Um, and that generates 70% of the electricity for that medical office. Um, we're now generating um, uh, 15 megawatts of power in California, which, is, which would supply 13,000 homes. Um, and we're changing the way that we operate so that when we leave our medical offices at, at the end of the day, we realize we're not hurting our good work by what we do with the environment. And so that's kind of the next phase in healthcare systems, actually healing our people and the people we serve where they live. Um, so I just want to close with, um, the understanding that our patients are aware of when we don't support them, a lot more than we think they do. So this is Jess Jacobs. Um, she's 26. She's, she um, said this at Ted, Ted Medwich, who we were out last week. We had a big display there. And she talked about this in, in relation to her own healthcare experience. So Kaiser Permanente is uh, into sustainable apples. And it turns out, yes, we now source a lot of our food sustainably. We are diverting 40% uh, of our waste from landfills by 2015. And she wrote about her experience, I recommend you go see it, because she's been under the care of many physicians uh, regarding a syncopal issue, which we, none of us understand, that has actually taken her to Children's National because only they have the technology to review her heart. Um, but if you look through the story, uh, it's a really sad state of affairs in 2013. So even with people with electronic health records, there's still a lot of paper going on and really a, a lack of communication. And her last slide I'll just show here is waste. So um, we are interested in looking at the whole spectrum of how we work with our patients and how we operate our health system. So just take a, take a look at that and look around you and think about all the ways that we don't realize our patients are noticing what we're doing well and not. And if you don't know, then please ask them and involve them to work with you. So with that, I'll turn it over to dialogue. Just so he's back. All right, so Dan Massis is, be, is back, having delivered our initial keynote. Um, he, White, already introduced him, and so without further ado, we'll um, switch to Dan, and then please, as you're sitting there, think of questions, things from your own experience, life stories, family members, um, that you know might be helpful for the group to hear, and um, the speakers to reflect on, because we're gonna go to that as soon as um, Dan's words are completed. Okay, so this will be uh, this will be quick, and it's a, a, a small, simple talk I actually put together after seeing Regina's slides about outside the toy box, and it reminded me of, of, of a simple thing we did, but I think it embodies some powerful ideas, and that is based on the observation that, um, you know, in general, health professionals are experts in knowing what should happen, 
that's what they're taught about what should happen, and they make plans to try and make that happen. But it turns out that patients are the actual experts in, what, in knowing what actually did happen, as you've already heard, and regardless of what the plan was. So wouldn't it be very useful in a holistic healthcare system to capture both sets of observations? That would be a truly learning healthcare system. But as you've already heard, almost all of our clinical systems capture only the provider view. They always focused on, on, on the organization and its provision of services rather than the partnership model. So here's an area where I just submit to you, um, we did an experiment to try and test uh, uh, patients as a novel source of new knowledge for discovery. And it's based on a, a very simple observation. So everybody who has gone through uh, any kind of health professions uh, school is, is familiar with the, the Poisson-shaped so-called uh, normal distribution, that is the bell-shaped curve, and it applies to drug responses. And this is, by the way, this is a 20th century healthcare. That is, it's based on the idea that on average, everybody is average. Right, and so you you know take the drug, and if something goes wrong, call me. And we don't you know we know that a certain fraction of people that's not going to be the case. So we have a very well developed information infrastructure nationally and internationally for watching bad stuff. What you know for monitoring uh, what's called post marketing surveillance. That is unexpected adverse events. It's led to you know blockbuster drugs being withdrawn. Those sorts of things, which represent the difference between doing a prospective clinical trial on a relatively small number of people and then unleashing it on the population at, all, at large. And so the the FDA has got a set of blinders on where they're just looking for bad stuff. But guess what? You know, patients might discover that there's an other side to the bell-shaped curve because, on average, for example, we knew at Vanderbilt that uh, that most of our adult patients, by the time they're in their 60s, have at least 10 ICD codes. They've had 10 different medical disorders, and they often have two or three concurrently. So, when you're treating one disease, in it, you're actually treating multiple diseases, whether you know it, know it or not, because the diseases don't know why the drug was was given. So, we call that drug serendipity, and. Uh, asked ourselves, why, why not capture uh, unexpected positive drug responses as well as the expected negative ones? It would give us, for example, insights into the understanding of both disease physiology, that is common modes of action, the way to create new treatment approaches at low marginal cost, and occasionally get entirely new sets of uses. So most healthcare professionals are very uh, familiar with, for example, uh, Eupropion as an antidepressant now was discovered uh, to be a major uh, effective drug for smoking cessation, not the original indication. And of course, Rogaine and Viagra are the other two socially prominent examples of drugs that were developed. Rog uh, Rogaine for, as an antihypertensive, Viagra as a coronary artery dilating agent, which had very dramatic other serendipitously positive effects. All right. So here's a, a portal that like uh, kp.org, but it's uh, one order of magnitude smaller. So my health at Vanderbilt had about 140,000 users, not, not uh, two or four million, and about 300,000 unique user ID sessions per day. It has all the same functionality though, secure communications, make an appointment, pay your bill, look at your electronic medical records, ask, ask your provider in real time questions and have all of that recorded as part of uh, of the interaction with the healthcare institution and also get targeted health messages, not the generic, you know, uh, eat less and lose weight and all that kind of stuff, but actually get health messages based on the actual diseases we know that you have uh, that are on the portal. So here is our study design. We knew when newly prescribed drugs would be given to patients who were on, at the portal. And so we would send us a message to them asking them to log on, saying there was something in the My Health portal. And what it would be is an invitation to participate in a research study knowing that they had just been prescribed a new drug in the preceding 30 days. We asked them would they be willing to do a 10 minute online survey of whether the drug worked, what its side effects were, and whether there was any serendipity. That is, whether there was an unintended positive outcome of a co-occurring uh, me medical condition they had. And you'll see here the publication. So this has uh, been recently been published. So this is what it looked like. It took very uh, uh, short uh, uh, amount of time. Uh, it, we, it got essentially an online informed consent. They were aware that participating in this study was not going to uh, send that information to their provider. 
and that uh, they understood it would be uh, uh, analyzed anonymously. And it would have the specific drug they had been prescribed, and they had a little slider bar. And then they could just kind of put where they were better or worse or no different. And then they could actually put in some words explaining what their reaction to that medication was. And then we asked them, were there any things, uh, in changes in a set of general things like your well-being or mood? And we had a category of about 10 different specific questions where, again, they didn't have to say yes or no. They could just kind of give a sense of whether things were better or worse. Here are the results. So we sent out over about 1,000 uh, invitations. 375 patients responded. We had 585 experiential reports. We organized those in, not into specific drugs, but into therapeutic classes. The data was treated, for those of you who are biostatisticians, as a sparse contingency table. This is the same kind of thing that the FDA does. Uh, they use relative reporting ratios. In other words, what they want to do is say, is there an unex is a higher frequency than we expect of the report of an adverse effect? So, you, you know, not all adverse effects are equal. We expect a lot of them. And so how do you detect the anomalies, the ones that are outside the expected envelope? And then of those 585, 135 had serendipity events uh, that were then reviewed by clinical pharmacologists. It was validated by virtue of the fact that most of the effects reported were, in fact, the known side effects in, in the drug inserts. And so uh, three times out of four, they got the side effects that we knew they might get as a result of taking them, and they, presumably they got informed about those. And the, here's a list of what they were describing. And uh, uh, one time out of four, they actually reported something that, we, that was not either known about the drug or told to them about it. And, the, and so if you look at the overall chai, uh, pie chart, uh, what they were reporting is that about three times out of four, the drug, luckily, had exactly the intended effect it was supposed to have. That's the good news. It's supposed to be that way. Not, about one time out of ten had no effect whatsoever. That's the, I'm sorry, bad luck. In fact, you know, inefficacy is our most common adverse effect. It's, it just doesn't work, right? And then they had these other effects, which were either good or bad in about one case uh, out of the five reports. The important thing we asked them in the online survey, had you told your doctor about what you just told us in this survey? Three times out of four, they said yes, but a quarter of the time, they said no. And we also know from the focus groups that the reason they said no is no one ever asked them. They would have been happy to volunteer the information. They had no opportunity to volunteer because they were given the opportunity only to say four things, right? <laughs> So here's an example of some of the serendipity of, uh, of a, 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 a drug uh, that was prescribed for one uh, effect, that is uh, Effexor, um, which uh, has both anticholinergic and antihistamine effects. So it, you know, prescribed for uh, anxiety, mood disorder, found that their allergy symptoms got much better when they took this, this drug. And so the pharmacologist is trying to figure, well, okay, well, how could that have happened? Another example of a, a, a triantrine, a drug for, uh, taken for tic duloro, the tic duloro found, for example, they had a much higher level of energy uh, when, in fact, this is a drug that usually doesn't cause that effect uh, in, in most patients. And then someone who was taking an antihistamine whose panic attacks went away uh, and an entirely different indication than the one for which it was prescribed. So that kind of ability to harvest uh, patients' uh, observations led us to the conclusion that a patient's experiential knowledge of the effects of medical interventions can, in fact, be systematically acquired and analyzed. You can do it. We just don't do it at scale. And that those unexpected outcomes will include both positive as well as negative events. And the positive things can actually help us improve care for other patients and understand more about disease physiology and drugs. And that in this sense, patient experience and knowledge can contribute both to, to, to discovery science. That is, they're, uh, again, uh, speaking to each of us as an experiment of nature, a unique combination of, uh, in this case, diseases and drugs prescribed. We can make a truly holistically uh, uh, progressing learning healthcare system if we just systematically listen closely to what happens as we do medical interventions. And so with that, I thank you for uh, your attention. And, and you actually can, unlike the cat, you're allowed to think outside the box. <laughs> <laughs> Spirit of partnership and engaging everyone. Please join in. You can address speakers' uh, questions to the group or comments to the group or to anyone in particular. And um, I hope we have a lively discussion. Good morning. Uh, 
just a little bit of a run back. I spent 30 years in IT, about six years in uh, deploying electronic health records. Recently, I've befriended a, a pathologist here in Philadelphia, up in Houston, Texas. And she sort of caught my ear on the idea that in terms of uh, pathology and laboratory work, uh, the labs have been, the electronic health records, the labs have been treated like the uh, redhead stepchild. The interoperability to be able to convert uh, lab codes to uh, electronic uh, health records, uh, the interpretation of the, of the codes, not so much in terms of diagrams, charts, or just uh, identifying their codes, but to help the physician to understand what the codes really mean, to give them some type of information as to what they should do next. And so I got involved in that uh, in the last six months. But my point is that after studying some of this, I found out that even within the approach bed of Lomas, is what it's called, each lab can really just have its own interpretation of those codes within the, 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 the primary group of those codes. Uh, it seems to me that there needs to be some type of more uh, enforcement, uh, continuity, because in IT, uh, we can get just anything you want, but it has to be structured and consistent. And I understand that depending on which lab you use, you can get different codes to mean the same thing. And uh, I was just wondering if I had any comments you could make on that. Maybe help me to do something for uh, this problem. Yeah, I have a comment. One of, uh, one of the best ways to fix all that is to show the patient. So here's what happens. We do all these, we do all these things internally and things don't look right. I, I had several conversations in my past. We were, for example, decided to release pap smears all the patients in real time. Okay. What we, guess what we found out? Some of the doctors themselves didn't know how to interpret the results. So it was sort of like, it was like as, as if Schwab didn't want you to see your statements because they were embarrassed that brokers didn't know how to tell you what, about your finances. So what you find is that uh, I find a lot of institutions are afraid to release these results because of those problems. And they say, well, let's just wait till we fix, clean it up. Well, guess what? It never gets cleaned up. There's no, there's no faster way to clean something up than to show it to your customer or the patient for them to say, I don't understand this. And things tend to get fixed very quickly. So is your institution sharing um, PAP and lab with patients in real time? On the system side, however, so there is a 20 year history of in, in trying to improve the coding and standardization of laboratory values. And the national leader in this is the LOINC, L O I N C, the Logical Observations uh, 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 Movement. It's at, based at the Regan Street, LOINC.org, um, has uh, a set of uh, names and codes and translation tables, a kind of Rosetta Stone for moving this. Uh, the data in a way where the data does carry the methods by which it was generated and so if there's some issue about what used the same code for a different method of determining say serum sodium or glucose it is possible uh, to to make the proper translations for a long time however um you know the the private community-based lab industry like MetPath and the others, you know, basically said, we never had anybody ask us for anything more than a fax of a piece of paper. And so it really needs to take the customers demanding that there be these, uh, these detailed data plus its metadata and provided to the provider organization so it can compute on that and actually join the interpretations to the data, much the way we talked about the separation of interpretation from data in genomics, the really the same thing applies to standard labs. And, and, and uh, again, it just means that the industry will only move as the customers demand that it provide essentially the raw data instead of a, a, a fax of a piece of paper.
Okay, so if, if somebody from IBM will actually uh, present their actual algorithm by which uh, Watson was built, I, I've been uh, watched uh, three presentations uh, by, by IBM at which they essentially claim it's a black box, we've got proprietary knowledge, we will not tell you how Watson works. And as long as they take that stance, I'm sorry, I'm not going there. <laughs> Yeah, so this was in, clearly both adverse event reporting and, if you will, serendipitous event reporting is biased by people's interest and willingness to do it, right? So you don't get a kind of population-based signal. This one was a little better controlled. One, because they were our patients. Two, we knew they had gotten the medication prescribed, and we were sending them a very personalized message asking their response to a medical intervention. So in that sense, it was, uh, it was constrained and not just a blog, a newspaper blog, where anybody could say anything about anything. But you're right. I think the whole notion of crowdsourcing is not that there is a pristine signal to noise ratio, but that there is valuable uh, across the entire crowdsource. You can actually distill uh, signals that have uh, enough value that it's kind of hypothesis generation that you can then pursue the hypothesis in a more prospective, structured way. So here's my simple view of this, having been in this industry for 40 years. I am embarrassed to say that I live in an industry that is willing to put its business interests ahead of the interests of its customers to the extent it's willing, willing to let them die by hiding information. Wouldn't that be the very definition of an unethical industry? So maybe we in this room could actually make a rule for the 21st century that healthcare is not allowed to do anything that's good for its business and bad for patients. Yeah, and I'm finished. Abnormal lab test results every 
just a three gallon result to not face patients, even with me in charge. Even with me in charge. So you're committing people to unhealth but not involving them. And I also want to point out, as Regina says, Kaiser Permanente now has a, has a HIPAA waiver process because so many of our patients want to talk about their care. So if I can share that with anyone. We have an actual process. We put in the database. It's time, it's time to mark. So Regina can say for X years, we are happy to talk, we are welcome to talk about their care and even keep helping other people. So it all can be done. You can do it with your patients. All right. Along this line, over in Fall Valley, there are the So the question concerns, has privacy protection gone too far or not far enough? Where are we on that? Well, well clearly HIPAA has become the all-purpose scapegoat for institutions that don't wish to share data. They just say, I'm sorry, we can't do it. There's a federal rule. But in fact, HIPAA would allow almost all, all of those things. Um, Randy Miller and I wrote an article uh, uh, in Jamia called uh, HIPAA Possumus. And, and that it actually, that, that the difference between the ability to share data and the kind of paranoid unwillingness to share data, often for business reasons, even though it would be good for patients to do it. So it's a redux of this problem of um, uh, assigning uh, a, a blame that actually doesn't assign to a regulation uh, and is, is just reflects a culture of hiding rather than sharing. And I'd like to add that, I mean, the pain that he spoke about that I painted is absolutely gigantic. It's called 73 cents because in the state of Maryland they charge 73 cents per page and told me I had a 21 day wait before I could access my husband's electronic medical records. Okay, and I was hundreds of pages, so this would be hundreds of dollars that it would cost. But on top of that, why 21 days? It was ridiculous, right? So that was a major frustration to getting to the kind of care that needs to happen. But secondarily, I want to make sure you're aware of Leon Rodriguez with the Office of Civil Rights has this amazing form letter. Email me or tweet to me, I can get it to you. But basically, he wants to make sure folks know the Office of Civil Rights is just as angry as anybody who withholds data from a patient who's asking for it. Because HIPAA is supposed to make sure you get to that access. Right now, there's tons of patients nationwide who cannot get to their access. Well, they went and had a major settlement against an institution who denied access. And I tell you, for a lot of folks, once we start talking about money, we start talking about major, major settlements, that's when they're going to open up and allow that access to happen in a more traditional and appropriate fashion. So we've reached the end of our time. I would, I'm sure that many people have additional thoughts, questions, reflections, and so, um, I think we have a break, right? Right, so I, I really hate to break this off because this has been fantastic, but we have a lot more content. So what we're going to do, because we're running a little bit over time, uh, is to cut the break to 10 minutes and we will reconvene at 10.50, both in this room and in the room next door, Liberty Ballroom C, for the paper presentations. And we welcome you to come up in the interim if you want to use your break to speak to any of us further. Right, and Thank thanks you. very much for all of the panelists.